Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. And today's game up on the tabletop is Arc Mage. This is a game by Starling Games that takes one to four players to play and is for ages 13 and up. And in the game, Arc Mage, basically the ending happened. The ending is an event that like devastated the land. It destroyed the main big mage tower in the center of the world. And uh, uh, all the six different spheres of life kind of like broke apart. And over time, the townsfolk started to hate magic because of this fact and eventually uh, six newcomers joined up and decided or I guess up to four newcomers joined up and decided to once again bring back magic when the alignment happens. And the alignment is when all six um, of the different elements lead back into one and then one archmage will be uh, crowned king or um, the master when the planets do align. Your job as an archmage or a um, soon to be hopefully archmage is to go around the land gathering a uh, different artifacts from the different elements and secure your place in victory. Upgrade your followers to become strong mages and you yourself to be the Archmage if you have enough power by the end of the game. Whoever has the most victory points power is the winner after all the planets do align. That's the basic idea of the game. Uh, I'll talk about how to play, how to set the game up, and of course my review. To begin set up for the game, the first thing you do is decide how many players you are playing. Based on the number of players playing the game will determine uh, how far away the suns are to aligning. It will determine how many tiles you use on this board here and what colors you want to use. Each of the different players are going to get a player board. They're also going to get the six different aligned suns. You're going to be placing them down randomly, all six, in one of each of the different six locations. There's a 3, 2, 1 on the top left-hand side of your board, and a 3, 2, 1 on the top right-hand side of your board. Put a sun in each of those locations. Then, based on where they are stationed, place each of your cubes of the following type of alignment into the location based on the number that they are on. You have, a, you have the black element in three, place your black cube on three and do the rest for all the colors. Give yourself a spell board. This is one of these boards here that indicates the one, two, and three spells that you'll be using in your deck. Place it face up so the number side is face down, and then take the deck of cards that you get. This deck of cards is going to be a numerous amount of spells, and each of the spells is going to be based on the different elements of the different six types. Give yourself and every single player a player aid, as well as a 15 followers and a mage tower. Uh, your main character will go on the middle of the game board, but maybe we'll talk about the game board in a second. Just go ahead and take all the rest of your tokens or characters, there's 10 of them, and place them into a pool. You'll also be taking your ward tokens and setting them aside, as well as spell tokens that you'll use in the game. There's a variety of different spell tokens. They could be anything from roots to chasms to ravines, etc, etc. Then the main game board. And the main game board is also based on the number of players playing the game. Uh, I have a two player game set up here, but how it works is pretty simple. You're gonna take and set aside all the tiles in the game, and there are a variety of tiles. Uh, the rest of them will be set aside. And of course the one with dice will also be set aside because that's for a solo game. Uh, you'll run into things like the crypt and the mine and the grove. There are six different types of these. Go ahead and just set them aside and put them in, 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 in your, your unique order. As well as there's going to be uh, towns, and there's going to be some hybrid cards and camps. You'll take uh, three, the three hybrids and the three camps and you'll shuffle them together and set them aside in a stack. You'll take the three towns, which will be placed face up on the game board, and then you'll take a number of wilderness cards, which are the six different types, or five different types, I should say. Blood is separate. And you'll shuffle those all up. And you'll place them down in the locations based on the rule book. Uh, towns are the only thing they need to know about is they need to be face up. And the main game board is going to have six locations along with a middle location where you place the tower and all players' characters. Well, you got the characters all set up and your game board's all set up. All you need to do is take these baggies here if you got the collector's edition and set them aside because you don't use them. And then, ready to begin the game. Starting the game off, the first thing that happens is a unique little aspect where based on the number of players playing the game, your suns or your moons or whatever, these little elements here are going to move on your game board. In a two-player game, you're going to move them uh, two, what, uh, each, uh, each of two elements one space away from the middle location. Um, so if I have a 3, 2, 1, and a 3, 2, 1, I'll move my 3 back to a 2 and my 3 back to a 2 or whatever. And then I'm going to subtract the elements from my relic spaces. Uh, relics are basically what we're going to call the elements for the rest of this time, okay? So uh, then after we've done that, we're going to start going through our player aid. 
on the front of your player aid, uh, the front of your player aid, it is going to describe the three phases of the game. And on the back, it's going to denote all the different cards and their element type and what they do and how long they last. Okay, so let's go through it. The prep phase, that's the first thing that you do and you're gonna skip this phase on round one. So in general, we'll skip this phase for the first round, but I'll go through it anyway. Remove all temporary spell tokens and effects. They're gonna have like little arrows going in a circle. That's like an end of round type of a thing. So it only lasts up until the very end of the round. If there's anything on the game board that has that or cards that you have, they go ahead and get put back either on the bottom of your board or removed back to the supply. Then you're going to update and refresh your spell book. Your spell book is always going to change based on the cards that you have availability to. And that is going to be based on the different acolytes that you have on your game board. So if you have a red alkalite and then you have a red green alkalite and a yellow alkalite, you'll get each of those cards, which means you should have three of them. So for each area on your game board, there's a spell associated and you'll have those spells, but it changes. So whatever you have on your board is the cards that you have. The next thing is your pro you have to progress a planet towards the conjunction, which is the middle of your top portion of your game board. You'll take one of them and you'll move it either, uh, if it's on the left-hand side, you'll move it to the right, and if it's on the right-hand side, you'll move it to the left until it hits the middle. Why do you do this? Well, this signals the end of the game when all of your elements have aligned. As soon as that happens, your game is over. Other players are going to have an extra turn, uh, but when their planets align, their game will be over as well after that turn. Okay, that's pretty simple. Prep phase is done. Remove the tokens, refresh your book, and then move a planet. Now we have the journey phase. And the journey phase is pretty simple as well. The journey phase is five actions. Nah, that's how much I'm gonna call it. You get five actions. And there are three different things you can do on your turn. The first thing you can do is move. So you'll start in the middle of the game board here and you can move in any direction as long as it's to an adjacent tile. And that will cost you a singular action. The next action that you can do is you can explore. You may only explore space if it is face down. And when you explore space, you will flip it over and you'll gain the benefit on the left hand side. This could be giving yourself bonus relics. This could be giving yourself bonus followers from the supply, or it could allow you to spend your relics to take a uh, follower that you already have, an acolyte, and put it on your game board in one of the six main spaces, the six main relic color spaces. After you've chosen to move or explore, there is another action left and that's to fight. And how it works is pretty simple. If you walk onto a space with an enemy's acolyte, you can go ahead and fight that acolyte. Uh, it's just gonna cost you one action. You, you defeat that acolyte and you can thusly remove that acolyte. Uh, another thing to note too is you can, if you must, if there is a ward there, you must remove the ward first. So whenever there's a ward in a space, it must be used uh, as an attack action to remove it before you can attack the acolyte that's there. So for instance, on my turn, uh, if I wanted to, uh, I'll show you a little example to use all of them, right? Let's just say, here we go. The board looks something like this. You can go ahead and say one action to move. And I'll do this one. And then you can say another action to move. That puts me at three. And then bam, another action to move. And then I can spend two actions to defeat these guys here. Um, whenever you're on a space and it doesn't have an acolyte of an opponent's or a one of these guys here, you may actually put one of your own acolytes on that space. So as you move along the game board, you can start deploying acolytes from your supply onto the different pieces of the board. There's a few rules though. You can never put an acolyte, you can never control any of the center spaces, and you can never control any of the three random hybrid spaces that are on the camp locations. But otherwise you can have one of your characters or one of your acolytes placed on there. Uh, another thing to note too is basically after you've taken all of your actions, you are now no longer going to be utilizing your character. However, you are going to do the journey's end phase. And the journey's end phase is different depending on where you end up on the game board. If you end up on a town space, you're going to gather relics and or followers based on all the different locations where you have one of your acolytes. If you have an acolyte in the green space, you'll gain, you'll gain nature. One in the black space, you'll get death. And if you have one on a town, you can actually get one of any color or take one of your acolytes from the supply. And there's also camps where you're just simply going to gain an acolyte. If you end your space on a camp, you'll simply take three 
of your acolytes from the supply and place them down into your company. Uh, then you have the race enclaves. That's the middle of the game board, as well as the three random hybrid ones, depending on where you're at. We'll talk about the middle ones first. The middle one will let you spend any two relics of one single color to recruit an acolyte onto your main game board here. So if I spend two green nature, I can take one acolyte from my company and place it in the green space. If I spend another two, I can take another Acolyte and place it in the green space. Each of these has a unique specific color, so you're not able to spend two green for a yellow or two yellow for a green, but you can spend as many of one color, and you wouldn't want to do more than three, you can't do more than three because the max you can have is six, but you'll place them in this little area here. Uh, the other action is your hybrid space. The hybrid spaces look similar to the main spaces, and you're basically going to get to do one of each type of hybrid character. So if it's a blue-green hybrid space, you can spend two blue for a blue one, and you can spend two green for a green one. But otherwise, that's what they do. Uh, the last one here is the wilderness location. Well, there's two more technically. Uh, the wilderness location will let you choose one of the following. A, you can place wards down. If you're on a wilderness location, and that's where you ended, you'll place a ward there and everywhere around it that's a wilderness location, protecting your acolytes. Or you could choose to build your mage tower. And if you do that, you'll progress to the mage tower's journey end. You may only have one mage tower and they can only be placed on a wilderness space, but mage towers, if you're ever ending on a space that has your one mage tower, can never be walked on by another opponent or destroyed. And when you end up on that space, you'll initiate and or promote apprentices. What basically that means is that you can choose any one apprentice, acolyte, to basically spend two of that specific element in place. So if I wanted to spend uh, two of the death, I can just simply place a black one, even though I'm on my mage tower. You can only do that one time, and it's basically a wild spend. But after that, you can promote, and you can promote as many times as you want. And how that works is pretty unique as well. You can spend any of your acolytes or recruits, uh, whatever you want to call them, <laughs> from your game board, as long as they're connected, and when you do that, you may take one of them and place it on the next higher tier of the ring. There are three tiers to the ring. So if you have a red and a black, you can convert two of them, one of each, into a red black. And if you have something like a red black and an orange black, you can convert both of them and place one onto the black, red, orange. Well, why do you want to do that? Well, because as you progress these guys in the game, you're going to get the cards of that type. So originally I might have had a green, black, and a red card because I had an acolyte on each of the three spaces. Well, when I took the black and the uh, red and placed it on the red black, now instead of having a green, red, and a black spell, when I refresh my spell book, I'll have the green, I'll have the, the red, black spell, and I'll have the green spell. So from three to two, but the cards as they improve will be worth more points at the end of the game and most likely will have more powerful effects. Uh, and of course, the highest tier one is going to be even worth more, and it's a triple powered spell. And so that is why you want to recruit those guys, and why you want to also promote them to give you better spells throughout the game. Never do you want to have at the end of the game more than one character on each of the spaces on your spell board, and never can you have more than one of each type of spell. You're only going to be limited, and everybody has the same exact spells based on the spells provided to you. There's also some additional spells which you'll take out at the beginning of the game uh, that are for single player. They're pretty well easily annotated there in the top left hand corner. Okay, so that's the basic idea of the game. Let's talk about some of the cards first before you go into the rest of the stuff. There's not a whole much left. No, not a whole much left though. So, but first of all, you look at your cards here and the top uh, left hand corner will dictate the type of spell it is like in on this area of the board. So, oh, this one here is if you have a character on the outer ring and is blue. It'll also tell you what type of game mode it's for. For instance, it could be used in solo player, but also it is this type of spell. And on the, on the right-hand side, just below the color of the spell, is the type of spell and how long it lasts. Some of them are instant effects, which have a little lightning bolt. Others will have an infinite symbol, which means it lasts for as long as whatever that thing is on the game board. And then others will have the end of turn, which we talked about. They go away at the beginning of the next round. And so you'll be able to, you can be able to utilize these, and you can actually cast these either when you're actually actively moving, spending actions, or on the journey's end phase. It really depends on the card. You should read them all individually. To play a spell, you will spend relics. So just like relics will give you your followers and allow you to place them up here. I've called them all kinds of things. We're recruits, followers, acolytes. <laughs> but when you gain these dudes, you can uh, actually uh, cast these spells along with being able to play the 
hit the dudes. And how it works is pretty simple. The cost of the spell is based on the elements, and each element is the cost. So a blue relic card, a spell card, is going to cost you a blue relic. Whereas, if you have something like a black and a orange spell, you'll have to spend a black and an orange relic. So the spells will get more costly as they move up on the game board, but they're also more powerful. Okay, so that's the basic idea of the game. You're going to be doing the three starting things for prep, removing effects and temporary like tokens. You'll update your book based on the guys that are on your board. You progress one of the planets. Do you align? If you do, this is your last turn of the game. And then you will do your journey. Spend five actions and actions are moving, flipping over tiles, and of course, attacking. Finally, you'll go to your journey's end, which will allow you to gain a benefit depending on the space you're at. It'll do different things. Most of them involve gaining dudes to your game board here, gathering resources and relics from towns, and then of course your mage tower, which is kind of a unique one allowing you to upgrade your units to make them stronger. And then you'll pass your turn. And play will just continue like that until all planets have aligned for you. And when that happens, you'll trigger the end of the game for you. Which means that nobody else is going to score during this phase, only you will. So that the tide can turn on another player's turn, but it won't affect your final score. You'll flip over this little tile here, and now you're going to check to see what spells you have. For each spell you have in the one position, you'll score a point. In the two position, you'll get two points. And finally, all your triple spells will score you four. And then you'll also score victory points based on the area that you control. So your acolytes, your followers, your recruits, your dudes, the guys that exist on this game board here, are going to have different locations. It could be the green area or the black area. And if you have the most, you'll score two points for each location. If you're tied for the most, you'll score one. And if you have the least, meh you get nothing. Towns and camps and other areas do not score you any victory points. This is a very low scoring game. So most likely you can't have really more than like 40 points in this game. But after you calculate your score, you're done. The next player will go. They'll change the board up in some way and then they'll score and then the game will be over. And whoever has the most points is the winner. So Archmage is actually a pretty simple area control style game. It involves area control, meaning placing acolytes on tiles. And then it also involves placing your acolytes on your game board and gaining new spells. Even if you never use those spells, they score you victory points and you can choose not to and save your relics or you can be a big spell spender. Maybe it doesn't help you improve your score, but it diminishes everybody else's score, thusly keeping you in the game. You can utilize the main game board and focus on either area control or spells or both and it's really up to you. The game is really, really tight in scoring and so it doesn't, I don't really see a need to where you have to do everything or you can't just do, um, you can't do a little everything if you don't want to. It's kind of like works pretty much however you would like. Uh, the actions are obviously pretty straightforward. Attacking, just simply spend a thing to remove a thing. And then when you have nothing on the board there, you place a dude down. Basic area control. And what makes this unique is the spells that are inherited in your spell book. I love the spells in this game. The quicken spell is one of your blue relics and it lets you get two more movement points, which are the action points in this game, which will allow you to move and explore explore and attack. You can do this um, as many times, well, one time every turn, uh, as many times as you like throughout the entire game. So you can only cast each one of the spells that you have in your book once on your turn, but it always refreshes the next turn so you can keep playing them. Things like Decay, where if anybody has more than 10 total relics, they'll have to lose two, except for you. It's a nice way to spend one to make an entire group of three people lose up to six total relics. Then you get bigger ones like Fiery Chasm. For two, it'll basically allow you to choose a line down the board and place a bunch of, bunch of chasms. And if ever players go through them, they're going to lose their followers, their acolytes, uh, into the supply as opposed to their company. And uh, as you'll see as the game progresses, uh, people really need these guys because they go everywhere. They can go on the game board for area control. They can go on your spell book to improve your spells and upgrade them. Um, sometimes they'll get stolen from certain spells. Certain spells will remove them from the game. Others will allow you to play certain spells on characters' portal boards in certain areas to affect how they play the game. There's a wide variety of uses for these guys, but a limited number of how many that you can use. And so pulling them from the supply into your company will be a strategic thing you'll be doing especially mid-game and you won't notice until you start realizing all of them start slipping away.
I love the idea of warding spaces. It kind of makes it a two for one. Whereas when you play a guy down, you go to a forest location and it protects all your spaces and having to decide which is the best option in each turn. And players affect you in this game as to how you want to play. Now this is an area control, so it runs into a few problems. And the first one is when playing a three player game, if you lock out somebody, it can end very poorly for them. Um, so when they have these 2v1 type things, it's possible that one player is not going to have that great of a time. In my opinion, these area control games work best with two or four players, and personally for Archmage with me, I think four players is the best. It has a teeter-totter type of a system, where when one player is doing very well, the rest of the table kind of crushes them down, so you have to kind of plan your strategy around that, and realize that if you go too hard, too fast, too early, all the rest of the players, even if they're not as good as you, will come together and mush you and you'll suffer for it. So being a sneaky player in this game, maybe even focusing less on the area control to begin with and more on your board and then utilizing your board to cast spells to power up the locations that you can gain is very useful. Heck, there are some spells that will literally let you teleport across the map is very, very powerful, as you know that movement slash actions in these games is really, really important. Uh, the other thing too about this game is if you're not super careful, you might end up placing dudes on your board in a similar location and you'll lose points for it. If you place too many guys in red and you don't utilize enough of them to where they all stay on red, that's only one point per dude, but there's only one red spell, so you only get one point. You need to upgrade them. Visiting the Mage Tower at the end of the game is very important, and so if you don't do that, you're going to suffer because of that as well. I really also love the different locations on the game board. They all feel very different. They feel like functionally unique. They all basically will give you different types of relics, which you'll use for different spells. They'll give you your recruits and allow you to convert them in different ways, and you have to make these planned out tactical decisions. But it's also not like super difficult either. This is definitely like a medium weight game once you start feeling it out. It's a low scoring game, it feels close all the time, and it feels really good. Speaking of really good, the quality of this game. This is the collector's version of the game, which means it has some upgraded components, but it is a beautiful looking game. The art is fantastic, the board is simplistic and easy to understand where the spaces go, even how to set it up in a two, three, and even four player game. There's also a solo mode, of course, which will in in involve a big bad guy, along with a unique tile for movement. And um, the boards, the player boards, are double thick. They're a little bouncy when you get those double, extra double thick boards, they don't stay flat, but otherwise they feel great, they look great, and you understand each portion very, very well. And you also understand how these guys upgrade from black to black red spending for a black red to black red and green red spending for a green red black. And so you kind of like already get it before you even look at it, it's a Venn diagram. Aligning the moons didn't make a whole lot of sense to me at first, till I realized what their function is. As all of your moons, elements, relics move to the center of the board here, and when they all align, that is your last turn, and that is where you have to make the biggest splash. When you do that, you can turn the tables. Maybe you'll get an extra green and black location on the board, giving you majority control, and score high. But what's nice is other players don't have to suffer from that as much. They'll actually get their last turn. And when they do that, it won't affect your score at the end. So let's say that Blue did a really good job and spread out their last turn and got a bunch of stuff. Instead of scoring when the last player takes their turn, they score right after their turn, which allows other players not to be able to take that extra hit and mush them back down. And that's a really good mechanic that a lot of other area control games should learn from. Overall, quality of the game is excellent. The art is super excellent. The game feels good and it's easy to play. And as long as you're not having any, you know, too many people pick on one single person for no reason, as long as there's reason and attachment to that, you don't have a player group that's gonna be like, I don't like Mike. Mike's always winning games. He won the third game last Friday. So we're gonna mess with him right now then it's going to be a very solid experience, allowing players to travel across the board. There's always ways to change the flow of battle, and you have to be sneaky about it too. I like Archmage. This is a solid little area control game. The spell book's very unique, and overall, it's a solid experience. If you're interested in taking a look at the game, go ahead, link's down below. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Archmage by Starling Games, the guys who did Everdell. Uh, if you're interested in uh, picking this little title up, I said before, there's a link down below. If you think I've earned your subscription, if if this is your second or third or plus symbol after that video that you have watched, maybe you should subscribe, hit the notification button, you'll see more of our videos. Every week we're posting usually at least 
uh, two to five videos a week. It really just depends on the schedule. And we have a live stream every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST. Um, and on the occasion, you'll see us on Whatnot as well, selling board games, talking about board games, and like little board game news updates. All right, guys, that's all I got for you this time. And as always, I look forward to becoming the Archmage while you are my subservient friends <laughs> next time.